Welcome to another episode of the Dharma Junkie Podcast. If you are a new listener, then welcome. I am Justin Otto, and I will be your host and your guide through a litany of esoteric and spirituality-based topics, as I myself continue on my own personal pursuit of awakening. If you've been listening to the show for a while, then I just wanted to say thank you. I genuinely appreciate everyone who listens to this podcast, and I hope that you've found it useful. And if not useful, then at the very least, entertaining. If you would like to support the show, I encourage you to please rate, review, and subscribe, as well as share it with anyone that you may think could find benefit from it. My guest on this episode is Jack W. Gregory, also known as The Accidental Journalist. Jack is a writer, actor, filmmaker, and podcaster from the county of Norfolk, England. Jack is also a former criminal and homeless addict who's battled mental illness for most of his life. So needless to say, we got along quite well, as we had a lot in common from both our past lives in addiction and our current lives in recovery. Jack used his love of creativity to not only get clean and sober, but to also work on combating trauma for himself and others. And he continues to be of service to others to this day. So definitely go check out The Accidental Journalist wherever you get your podcast from. But for now, without further ado, Jack W. Gregory. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of you might catch yourself sliding in and out of all the hallucinatory state. Do, just relax, relax and enjoy it. Do, just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, your and mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, and scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, chaos is beautiful. Is beautiful. So, Jack Gregory, how are you doing, man? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Good. Excellent. Glad to hear it. It's been uh, an interesting week for me. I don't know, man. I don't know how your week's been. I uh, uh, found out a friend of mine passed away. I just found out yesterday. Uh, he died this past weekend. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And then uh, I saw him, and uh, he was dead like three days later. <laughs> so. You know, just That's still, hard, still wrapping my head around that. Yeah, it is what it is, man. It's part of life, especially when you uh, surround yourself with addicts. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember going to um, eight funerals in seven days. Yeah. Um, that was hard. And, uh, you know, I was only in my 20s. Yeah, that, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> so, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Let's start with a little bit of background, man. Like, tell me about yourself. Yeah. Like, let's, uh, Let's get a little bit of your story and what it is that you do. Yeah. Okay. Um, you want me to go back to like when I was younger and I, I mean whatever you want, man. Like yeah, I mean like what yeah. what what makes what makes you you? You know what I'm saying? Like okay. So um, I was born in Glasgow, Scotland, in 1977, um, and I was a about 18 months old, I was taken away from my mum. Um, I've read some of the paperwork recently, and it said that um, she was of, of low intelligence um, and couldn't look after me, and I know that wasn't true. Mm. These were all from social security. I, these, these are things that I've found out in the past couple of years. Right. And um, so I was adopted into a, a family in Yorkshire, which is the north of England, which is, I, sp- I suppose... Um, like on Midwest, like mines and farms mm. um, everywhere. And uh, so I grew up during um, the, the, the miners' strikes um, in, in the 80s, and I saw the violence outside the door. Um, we were sometimes taken to school on the same bus that they used to take the um, miners that crossed the picket line in. They, they were called scabs. It's from Margaret Thatcher. Um, our Prime Minister tried to shut down all, all the coal mines. Um, and a lot of towns, including that town, never, never sort of got any better. Um, I was, I was a bit shy when I was a kid, mm. um, of low intelligence. 
as people would say. Um, a bit thick, people called me. But um, didn't really have any friends. I was a bit of a loner. Um, and on my eighth birthday, I remember having a really nice birthday. Um, my parents had bought me a, 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 a teepee for the back garden. And um, I remember my mum bringing out this a uh, big plateau of cakes and stuff like that. It was really, really nice and, and, and fizzy pop. And later on that day, I remember my dad sitting down and reading his newspaper and I sat on my mum's knee. And I remember it vividly. She had a tear in her eye and she told me, she said, um, you know, I love you very much. You know, we both love you very much. And I'm like, yeah, um, you didn't actually belong to us. Um, your yeah, real mum couldn't look after you you came to us, you're adopted and we love you very much and you should know that you're loved very much because we chose you but my brain being different to other people's a bit divergent some, some people might say mm. all I heard was you're adopted you're not wanted and that's when the light out went out for me and that's when I started to feel invisible. I don't say that I went to sort of live in the shadows. You know, when people say they kind of live in the shadows and, they, you know, they go into the darkness. Mm. I, I say that I went just out of the peripheral. You know it's there, but you, you can't quite see it. You can feel it, but you know it's there. Right. And that's where I lived for many, many years. In just outside of the peripheral, feeling invisible. I didn't know who I was. Um, I'd got a uh, fear of uh, just loss. Um, I had this almighty identity crisis, mm. and at eight years old, that's not that's right. not healthy. Yeah. But that was my first real trauma, um, and I began to lie because that's the way that I dealt with it because I thought if I don't know who I am I can be anyone I want to be I can be have been anywhere done anything uh, and nobody can't tell me any different right um, so you know I would tell these you know, really mad lies like where I'd been on holiday you know to, to, I vaguely remember telling the teacher that I'd, I'd gone to in Vietnam <laughs> uh, on holiday <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'd seen a film with um, Vietnam in it. But um, it was just, I I just felt like I'd lost everything and I, I lost myself. And I became very good at mimicking other people. I became very good at um, sort of impersonations of, like, you know, our, our local television. And I, I got quite good at like accents and um, I could carry on a life for a long time so you know I, I just I, I just carried on doing that for a long time I, I was put into um, the special school system um, because I was dyslexic uh, and and back in I suppose it'd be 1988 they knew what dyslexia was, but they didn't really know the sort of depths of it. Mm. Um, so I was put into a school for maladjusted children that was masked as a special school, you know. I, I was brought up in a really good family, you know. My, my dad was a, a, worked a, a civil engineer for British Rail. My mum was a social worker. They owned their own house. We came from a nice part of of our town. My mum and dad were very well known, very well respected in the community, they still are. But, um, you know, the school I went to was a lot of kids from council estates and welfare families, mm. um, broken families. Um, and the only sort of time that I'd ever seen that was some of my family over, over in the next town along. But you know, I, I never really saw it, and um, these kids got, you, you, you know, used their frustration in violent ways, so I got bullied and beaten a lot. Um, 
and then I started see the school was smack bang in, bang in the middle of of of, of a, a, a market town, but there were farms all over. So um, it was pretty much a mile in any direction it was houses. So I used to run um, a pot, uh, pawn videos, um, knockoff tapes. Um, we had this thing called the Top 40 on a Sunday on the radio that was recorded and would sell them out. Um, I had some of the first sort of original copied CDs. I remember it was Prodigy Fat of the Land. I um, made a ton of money off that. Um, so I'd do that and I'd, I'd, I'd be back in time for um, back in time for pudding. At dinner time, I was a good runner. I was I was good at cross country. I could run far. I could run fast. I could do a mile in about seven minutes, seven and a half minutes. Mm. So you know, I but I always had a brain. I just couldn't get it down on paper. So when I left school, I couldn't could barely read or write my name. But I, you, you know, and, and the um, the only things that I left school with qualifications was. Uh, a certificate on changing a fuse and a plug, riding a 50cc moped, answering a private telephone, uh, and, th- and these were the things that they did for the, for, for the thick kids. Um, but I realised that I, 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 I wasn't thick, I just I couldn't get it down on paper. Right. Um, right. By the time I was 14, I was already in AA. Um because I would just drink, I would take whatever I could, whatever anybody give me. Um, I was being abused by um, some of the teaching staff at school, uh, physically, um, sexually. Um, and I, I tried to hide that for years mm. in my own brain. I can even admit to it. But it messed me up. It messed me up really, really badly because they knew I was the little liar. So, you know, they would say to me, you know, well, who's going to believe you anyway? Because you, you, you're just a liar anyway. So nobody's going to believe you. So you might as well just succumb to this, and which is, you know, what I did. Wow. And, and the drink and the, the you know, would help me, and the drugs would help me just get out of that. Um, I left home at, um, about 17, 18. <laughs> And, um, yeah, my best friend threw himself in front of a train in front of me. Oh, wow. Um, oh, Jesus. I lost a mate in a fight in a nightclub because he got a bottle shoved in his neck. Jeez. I, um, Jeez. So it was just trauma upon trauma upon trauma that was building yeah. and building and building. So yeah. all I did was just try and mute it with drink and drugs right so i did yeah um yeah. i had various years of sobriety but um i i just lost it one night in a nightclub 10 p a pint um it was pound to get in and 10 pence a pint and um I got very, very drunk and I saw this guy slapping his missus, so I told him outside because I'd had enough. Mm. I'd realised that, you know, all the beatings that I got actually didn't hurt as much as I thought they did and that I could probably hit back as hard. And we went outside and we went to the back of the nightclub and there were some market stalls mm. and I lost it. And I, um, I got caught on camera 300 yards away from the police station, straddled across his chest, just beating him, crying screaming um I got put away um and that wasn't easy what what year was that that was 99 98 99 22 yeah wow um and I was ill prepared for prison I did, you know, I, 
you know, I speak to a lot of people do, doing this and, you know, running my own podcasts and that. And, you know, I speak to a lot of people that are extremely comfortable with prison. You know, they spent a lot of time in prison, right. you know, bank robbers, people, uh, you, you know, self-proclaimed terrorists and, you know, they've changed their life, but prison sort of shaped them in a way that, they kept going back and going back and going back and I said I was never going to go back again. I did 18 months, I got out and I said I'm never going back again and I haven't, not that I haven't been close. No. Um, so I got sober for a little while. I, I, I moved about 200 miles away to a place called Portsmouth, which is way down south past London on, on, on the south coast. Mm-hmm. And um, I started rehab there. Um, got into a day program, a few day programs, uh, and one of the guys set uh, one of the um, uh, you know one, one of the helpers there said, you know, I've got a brother that it works on films. He knew that, as you can see, I love film, it, and uh, he knew that I love right? film, and he's like, uh, I got a brother that's working on on, on a on a film at the minute. Um, out in Berkshire, said, I'll, you know, if you get to three months sober, I'll take you out there to a real film set, and that was Snatch. Oh, wow. Guy Ritchie. That was just for one day, and, you know, I got to stand there for that famous um, scene where the, uh, you, you know, you got the, 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 the rabbit. Oh, and, the, uh, the, the coursing scene. Oh, the, the course scene. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and I, I, you know, I got there for a couple of hours and then, you, you know, I, I kind of fell in love with the business. And then I got to farm on the sober and then I got on what's called the Princess Trust, which is a program, um, for young people, um, that helps them get back on, on track. Mm. So I went to be beco- I went and became a, a sound engineer. I did the Princess Trust, became a sound engineer through that, uh, became a, a, a comedy club magician through that. I'd always loved magic. Um, and then by the time I'd finished that, I was six months, seven months sober. Um, and then I met um, the woman that would become my first wife. Uh, and we were together for quite a few years, and I had 12 years clean and sober. Um, you know, and... But I, I was I was not always sober in there, you know. It was yeah. sometimes it was just dry, right? Yeah. And yeah. then I tried to get into the film industry. I'd written a pretty good script, if I do say so myself. Mm. Um, people were after it. I'd spoken to some major celebrities over here. We were talking about getting it done, but I got into drinking again. I got into doing the lines again, and I just <sighs> cheating on my wife. Yeah, man. Just. Fuck me up, mate. Honestly, and, uh, and did I've been there? <laughs> yeah, uh, I ended up, yeah. I ended up homeless, on my ass, you know, on and off of people's sofas, um, staying on my friend's sofa at the weekend so I could, ha- you know, at least have access to my daughter. Yeah, I was walking seven mile a day just to see my daughter. Um, I was living in a shop, the shop doorway of HMV in Norwich City Centre. Um, went through lymphoma, homeless, oh, in the shit. snow. Um, got through that a few times. And then, never forget it, 26th of June, 2014, I'm sat in a crack house. Fat ball in my hand. And I went, this is, you know, this is, this is warm. Or, you know, I'm not on the street. It's warm. It's 10 o'clock at night. So pretty much I can fall asleep and I'll be all right. And I just said, God, I don't even know if you exist. I'd like to think you do, you know. I'd like to think you've, you've been part of my life sometimes, but I can't live like this anymore because this is killing me. I can't keep disappointing my daughter. A few weeks before, I tried to punch through a oak door just to get to her. 
I can't do this, God. I'm not with drugs, so please take away this first, take away this hunger. And I took a huge, great big hit on this bowl and fell asleep. Four minutes past twelve on the 27th of June, 2014. I awoke and I haven't used since. Something changed, something snapped. And, I, you know, to me that was God. Um, and I praised him for that. But, you know, I, I started working a program. Um, I went to a food bank mm. as a homeless man. And I, I, I went to a coffee morning. I was sat there having a coffee. And this really kind woman behind the counter, I was wearing a Doctor Who t-shirt. And she's like, I love Doctor Who. I love your t-shirt. I'm like, oh, that's great. Can you buy me some tobacco? <laughs> and she did. She bought me some tobacco and she, right. she made me a coffee and she said, I'll take you for something to eat if you want. Despite other people saying, no, 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 don't do that. It's, it's bad news. You know, right. but she took me out for something to eat. Um, You know, I married her a couple of years ago. You know, 28th of November, uh, 2019, we got married. Um, but yeah, um, and then, you know, we got together and things were fine. I started going to a church and, and started building on my faith and, um, started building on a 12 step program mm -hmm. and something I was talking to one of the, um, leaders and something clicked and it was, um, trauma that had been ruling my life and that this trauma that had gone undiagnosed, that had gone all these years without being tackled and looked at, it had just been poisoning, from, poisoning me from the inside out. And so I started looking at it, but then in February 2015, I started to feel really ill. Um, I started to like, physically just shake. I remember being in the bed and shaking so hard that I nearly came off the bed. Wow. Um, and what was causing that? This, this was, well, I'll get to that in a second. I, I was, this was the Thursday. Um, the Friday, I went to pick my daughter up from school and I felt horrible all day. Mm. Went to pick her up, picked her up from school, came to bring her back here and, um, walked 100 yards and every single bit of breath went out of my body. Just, <gasps> just expelled from my body and I, I had to sit down and I couldn't breathe. Mm. Managed to gain my breath back after five minutes, you know, after really trying not to scare my daughter, and I got her back. The Saturday morning, I felt all right. Oh, I felt better. I even managed the bacon sandwich I hadn't eaten for days. Mm. I was surviving on prayer and painkillers. The Friday night, it started again. The Saturday, uh, uh, the Friday night, it was worse. The Saturday, it got even worse. And the Sunday morning, I rang my ex-wife and said, please come and get our daughter I need to go to the hospital she said I'll take you because you, uh, you know our daughter needs to see that you're going to be alright so I got out of the car this must have been about half past eleven in the morning gave my daughter a kiss walked into the accident emergency and by half past seven I was dead four minutes um, I'd stopped breathing I had type 2 lung failure, double pneumonia, pleurisy, and tuberculosis. Um, to top all that off, the um, drugs that they gave me for the pneumonia yeah. and the tuberculosis, they didn't mix well and they caused hallucinations. And then I began to think that I'd caused the end of the world and that God was punishing me. And I thought I'd caused the apocalypse. I thought they were poisoning me with my own blood and I had this almighty just mental breakdown, spiritual breakdown, physical breakdown. I wouldn't eat. I was just over six stone, which would be about 80 pound. Jeez. Um, I lost 50% of my muscle mass. Um, my stomach had shrunk, um, probably to the size of a small potato. Um, 
I couldn't even drink without being sick. My mouth was covered in sores. One of the drugs had caused this. It was like an almighty burn. It felt like an almighty burning. It was a rash from my uh, torso to my neck. And um, I thought they burned me with acid. And, and that really fueled the thing. I thought they were all holding kangaroo coat. Um, wanting to, you know, they were going to kill me at some point, but they were going to play with me. And this went on for a couple of weeks. I had people from my church coming and telling me that they love me and, you know, bringing me stuff in, bringing me drinks and, and stuff, but I was spitting at them and shouting at them and trying to attack them. I didn't know who I had. I'd lost everything. And, um, I just remember sitting there thinking, I can't do this anymore. I remember thinking, oh God, just please, even if you're going to send me into oblivion, just take me now. At least give my family some, you, you know, at least, at least give my family some sort of end to this so I don't give them any more pain mm. and I don't know who it was I, I'd, I'd felt this you know, there'd been this doctor young Asian doctor young female Asian doctor and she'd come in and the thing about the National Health Service here is the rules are that you're allowed to wear a cross but you're not allowed to show it and I remember she, she's in the room and um you know, there's nobody else there and, and, and this cross would pop out and she'd see me looking at it. I was transfixed on this cross and then when somebody, when she saw somebody walking by or, you know, when she felt there was somebody going to come in the room, she'd just put it away and smile. And then I felt, after a few days, I felt this presence just at the end of the bed. And I just felt this peace. And I think part of it is, you know, my faith and, and God showing me that I was getting through it. And another part is that some of these drugs have started wearing off and they were bringing these bowls of water and a sponge for me to wash. I hadn't, I hadn't washed in, in, in weeks. But for some reason, I just took the sponge and I started wiping. And as I started wiping this this rash just started disappearing. I couldn't explain it. It just, this rash just went as I washed it away. Yeah. And I started getting a bit more clarity in my head. And they no longer wanted to section me. And then people started coming in, bringing, bringing me tins of spam. In, in, because I said I, I wanted to eat. So they'd bring me in tins of, people from the outside would bring me in tins of spam. And the nurse would cook it on the ward, so all you could smell through this ward all day long was just <laughs> spam being grilled. And it was the most beautiful smell that you'd ever smell, but I just started getting better. And then I started, you know, talking to people and, and looking at my trauma. Mm. And then once I started dealing with that trauma, I, I, the longer I went in my sobriety and, the, you know, the better I got at, Dealing with things, and um, you know, in uh, I twenty sixteen, I lost my mum to cancer in the April, <clears throat> and then in the June, um, my sister had a baby, baby Luna. And she was beaten to death by her dad at two days old. Jesus Christ. Holy I shit. snapped. Yeah. I, I didn't use, but, you know, I had this almighty amount of rage. And it took a year to bury her. So I went through a year of going through this internal torment of, you know, I... I, I I want him dead, 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 and he's, he's in prison. And he gets life with the minimum of 10 years. 10 years. Jesus. Minimum of 10 years. Minimum of 10 years. 
seems like you should and be And then nine months later, more. nine months later, he's murdered by his cellmate over a debt for space. Mm. Then I didn't have anybody to be angry at because he was dead. So this unforgiveness starts boiling in me again and boiling in me again and I start getting sort of depressed and a bit self-destructive, not using, but just getting really angry and wanting to punch things all the time. Mm. And the funeral comes around and one of the elders from the church says, don't worry, I'll take you 200 miles away from where I live. And we go up there the day before and he pays for the hotel room and the next day we go to the funeral. And his mum, after the funeral, walked up to me and flung her arms around me. And she wouldn't let go and I broke. And I hated her for that minute. I hated her and hated her and I got in a car with Chris to go back for the wake. And I broke down and I said, can't do this. And I knew then that I needed to forgive her. I needed to forgive him because Forgiving isn't forgetting. Forgiving isn't saying that's all right, what you've done, that's all right. Right. Forgiving is actually just loving someone enough just not to let them invade your mind. And then I started looking at the unforgiveness that I had in my life. And then when I started working with the unforgiveness, I started working with the trauma. I started looking at the trauma of being abused. And then that, looking at the behaviour, that, well, actually, that is the reason that I treated women like I did. 2016 I wrote my first book A Personal Apocalypse then I spent six months working with escapees of human trafficking and uh, that changed my life yeah. wrote a book about it yeah. I got asked by a, a director by the name of Joanna Hogg um, who was making a film that was funded by Martin Scorsese um called The Souvenir, and it was being made just down the road from us. Um, and, she, you know, it, it was about drugs yeah. and how they ruined families in the 80s. So she asked me to go down and speak to her, and I went down to speak to her, and, I, you know, I, I, I consulted on the film, and then she asked me to play Ray. And so I played Ray in both films, and consulted on both films, and I've been lucky to get involved with the Discovery Channel and be, you know, involved in Band Up Abroad and Twisted Killers and stuff like that for a bit of fun. Um, and I had all this energy that I needed to get out. I'd, I'd, I'd tried for years to become a, an actor and I'd done a bit of it, but I felt a bit lacklustre. So I was talking to my friend and he, um, Jason Edwards, and he's a hostage and barricade negotiator. Mm. Job. And um, funnily enough, he became that because he, he helped me get over some anxiety when I was younger, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And he, he realised after speaking to me that he wanted to get into that sort of stuff. So he, he, we were talking and he said, well, why don't you do a podcast? And um, so I, I, I said, yeah, all right. So we, we did a podcast and we started talking about it and we started talking about uh, negotiation and, and stuff like that. And then it, it, it all went from there. And then people said that, you know, people started calling me a journalist. And I'm like, I'm not a journalist. Oh, actually, I am. <laughs> and I fell into it accidentally. So right. I became the accidental journalist. And um, since then, I've been sort of speaking to people like you, but, you know, getting people on my podcast that have been through similar things. Right. And I've sat there and I've cried with people. I've connected with people on such a deep level because we, of the trauma that we share. Not trauma bonding, but we talk about the trauma that we've shared because that's a healthy way of, it's how you, it's how you, you know, move it. through it. It's the only way to get through it is to, to move that trauma by, by speaking it. I know many, many people will tell you the same thing. That, that's really the only way to work through that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it sounds then, like you've had a your fair share of trauma. Yeah, yeah, um, and I couldn't deal with it, and that was what put me on my ass so many times. I think not being did. able to deal with trauma. And there's so many men out there that are my age 
that can't deal with trauma because they've been brought up in this toxic way of thinking that men don't speak about their trauma, men don't speak about their pain, men don't show emotion, men don't do this, men don't do that. Well, what about what men do? Right. <laughs> what men should do? Yeah. Um, you know, it's healthy for a man to cry. It's healthy for a man to speak about his emotions. It's healthy for a man to um, get upset, you know. Um, I'm so lucky to be able to have emotions and get upset. You know, um, when I died, I ended up with um, brain damage through hypoxia, mm. um, which, you know, sometimes makes me forget things, which is why I have to catch up with myself sometimes when I'm speaking because mm. my mouth works faster than my brain. But, you know... Um, and that's that's when I started that I'm going to be a voice for other people that because I felt like I didn't have a voice for so many years as an addict, as a man, as someone who's gone through trauma, as a, a survivor of sexual abuse, or, you know, as a as a, a homeless person. I've been in the just outside of the peripheral for so many people right. my whole life, right. um, and I want to help people come out of that and, and this for me is the ideal way to do it I get to speak to so many people and I really love it and my, you know um, my kids are proud of me and you know um, I'm proud of me because I I, I, I I never had that sort of emotional intelligence you know it was eat, drink and fight yeah you know I've, I've collected debts for a living I've enforced Gangland debts. I've I've I've, I've been out and I you, you know I've I've taxed drugs off of drug dealers and you know run some long cons and fought bare knuckle in the underbellies of bars and these were all because I wanted to find that next level that you know that next next mental level. None of it really did. None of it really touched it. It was all right for that sort of euphoria for the moment, but right. it's just know, it's just like um, it's just another way to cover up your pain, right? I mean, that's all. Yeah, seems like that's all that all that was, you know. And I think that's it's every, just I think that, that way that, of thinking. I think that's everybody's problem. Is everybody just lacks the coping skill? At least you know addicts. I mean, pretty much everybody in general, in my opinion, but mo addicts have a special way of not being able to cope with things. You know, it's like, oh, I have to dump something on top of this, make, make my reality go away immediately because I cannot tolerate it. Hmm. That's been my, that's been yeah. my experience with addiction. It's like, you know, I just wasn't, you know, I also have suffered quite a bit of trauma in my life. Uh, I am also a cancer survivor and a uh, sexual abuse survivor. And I've been, yeah, you know, I've, been through a lot of shit myself so man I, I really identify with what you're saying and yeah i just didn't know how to i didn't know how to sit with that shit i didn't know how to just accept it as what it is and move through it so i don't you know i self-medicated because it's what we do because we weren't taught a proper way to handle our emotions no and it's, it, it, it's, it's not healthy to bag up your emotions you, you know I, i've i've spent i'm, I'm I'm near enough 45 years old. Mm. I've been around the um, the 12 step circuit for a long, long time. But even at 14, when I was 14 years old, and I told you about those teachers that used to abuse me, mm. um, the guy that became my sponsor in that 12 step program, I'm not going to name it. But, um, you know, he was a friend of the, my teacher. Mm. And they were passing me about. You know, it's, it's these networks of people go really deep into education and into health and stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's scary. Um, but I spend so much time hating them. And drinking on it and using on it and that you know that there's some of the reasons why I did but I needed to forgive not forget not like needed to love myself enough and love them enough not to want to kill them not 
to let them have any more space in my head. I had to hand it over to a power greater than myself, right. which is what I did, and that's the only reason that I've been able to stay sober, because I've started dealing with these things healthily. You know, one of my heroes of, of, of faith is a woman called Corrie Ten Boone. And as a young woman, she 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 um she grew up in Amsterdam, clockmaker's daughter. Um, and when the Nazis occupied uh, Holland, her and her family would hide um, young girls away from these Nazi soldiers. And they ended up in uh, Ravensbrück um, concentration camp, which was one of the worst concentration camps that were out there. You know, it was up, up there with Auschwitz. It was so bad. And she found this place. Um, it's called the hiding place. And, and she got young girls away from... It was her, a Bible, and these young girls. And she got them away from these rapists these um, you know these SS guards that would just take your women you know her, her her sister was taken and she was she was raped and you know that set Corey on a, on a mission and she she hid these women and, and, and they were never found this hiding place was never found at Ravensbrook and something like 30 or 40 50 years later she is like she was doing a speech and um, talking about this and then afterwards she was meeting and greeting people and there was this guy and she re instantly recognised him he may have been older but she instantly recognised him as the most sadistic guard that was in that concentration camp oh, wow. she personally saw him rape and, and maim dozens of, 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 of girls and he said to her, I'm, I'm sorry. I found God. I found Jesus. I want to ask you for, ask you for your forgiveness. And she stood there and thought about it. And she's thinking, no, I can't forgive this man for what he's done, for what he's done to my family, or for what he's done to all these other people. But then she thought, well, God can. You know, she said, God, yeah, so she handed it over to God. She said, God can forgive you. And she hugged him and forgave him if she can do that right you know yeah yeah it makes a I, I can forget that, those. yeah that makes makes a makes a lot of the things that we tend to hold against people no matter how extreme they are in our opinion uh just seems to make them a lot less serious that story yeah yeah, that, that level yeah. of forgiveness is just something so profound that you just don't see that very often. It seems that you, you know, don't. That, that's an act that, by all rights, you would think is unforgivable. So many girls, so much sadism, yes. so much cruelty, and for her to take that on is very profound. It is, and that when I heard that story, it really affected me. You know, and um, you, you know, it was it was Chris, uh, one of the leaders at the church, that told me it. And um, you know, I, you know, if 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 she can do that, what what can I do? And then I I started to learn about this thing called unforgiveness and how it affects us mentally and 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 how our mentality affects us physically. Um, you know, I have a few disabilities, and um, you know, a lot a lot of them are aggravated by stress. And to not forgive those people in my life, to not forgive my abusers, um, to not forgive myself, to not forgive um, Liam for what, what I did to the family, um, to not forgive those that taunted me and bullied me uh, through most of my childhood, it would have made me even more poorly because unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Right. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Because if you do something to me and then I start hating you and not forgiving you, 
you give a two shits about it. Right, yeah, it's not going to bother me no. in the least. I'm it's, not going to think about exactly. it ever again. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just going to bother me, and yeah. it's going to sit on my heart, and then it's going to mess with my mind, and then it's going to put me in that danger. So, you know, forg- people say I forgive too easily, but not to forgive is the most dangerous thing, and, and, and this is what I explain to them. I have to forgive for my own safety. Right. Not for their safety. I don't forgive them for them. Call me selfish, but I want my own mind, I want my own body and spirit all in all level so I can have a family and I can look after my family and I, I, I can be a good dad and I can be a good husband um, this time round. Um, that I can live a healthy life, that I can be an active, um, valued member of my community, of a community. Um, you know, I live in a beautiful small town in, in, in rural Norfolk. Um, and this has been my making. I'm only nine miles away from where I nearly died, but, you know, it's, it's just, my life is so much different now because I started looking at fixing instead of dulling. You know, I started looking at um, the cure instead of the problem. Um, I've got friends that really get wound up because I do this because they think that I live in the past. But I do not agree with my past, and I wish to shut the door on it. You know, I'll make that perfectly clear. The life that I've lived is the life that I've lived. I've done tremendous harm to myself and other people. But if I can stop one person from making that bad decision, if I can show one person that if a man like me, unwanted and unloved, and homeless and addicted and hated people would cross the road to get away from me just not to talk to me if a man like me can do that and make the steps to become a better man what can other people do you know they say oh well a leopard can't change its spots well no a leopard can't change its spots because that's a physical thing You can't change a a physical thing. You can't change your birthmark. You can't change your spots, but you can change the way that you think. And, you know, um, that's what I've done. And it's all about resetting my brain to do things that it never did before, like think before I act. To think about situations before I walk into them, to talk my way out of a fight to want to just genuinely help people get what I've got we can only get to keep what we have by giving it away yeah yeah that's that's for sure (laughs) 100% man that's something that I picked up in the rooms only keep what we have by giving it away for sure and it's true it's true you know that's I tell anybody that's um, struggling I, I make myself available to, you know, like, because, uh, I know what it's like to just need <clears throat> someone to talk to and just someone to, you know, just get that, you, like we we're saying, man, you, you have to, you have to talk about it. You have to get that shit out. Like you can't bottle that stuff up forever or, you know, you and I both know what happens. Yeah. Jails, institution, death. That's where it, that's where yeah. I end up. Those are your options. Those are your options, pretty much. Yeah. With that yeah, much unchecked yeah. trauma and you know substance abuse as a as a symptom of that trauma, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. Like the the substance abuse is just that's a symptom of something else. That's nobody wants to live like that. There's nobody hmm. nobody wants. Let's be realistic. I've never met not one single person in, in any recovery group that wants to live that way. These are hurt fucking people. These are just hurt people. And they don't know how to stop the hurt. <laughs> yeah. 
because we've learned it's learned behavior just like we learn learn to ride a bike or we learn to drive a car or we learn to walk you know we learn to deal with situations in a certain way Mm -hmm. and as an addict having that divergent brain having that different chemistry to other people um we deal with things in in such a different way um and that you know the way i see it is it's 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 like a computer and you you get programs that that conflict um so the computer starts messing up and then you bring you know you bring all these other people to like you know spyware blockers and adware and stuff like that you know so like for life that's like drink and drugs and stuff like that and it just doesn't work and it just makes it worse so you have to reset to factory settings because the opposite of addiction is communication and the thing that we lose with addiction uh, trauma guilt shame um is connection connection with ourselves connection with our friends our family connection with god we just that's what it does it causes disconnection so what we have to do is um reset back to factory settings and then build that connection back and then we can start looking at things like um building relationships and 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 and, and bridges and mm. making amends and stuff like that and you know it's 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 a long long journey but you know it's a, a 30 30 year journey for me but it's um like i say it's only in these past couple of years that i've started getting it right because you know having that great brain reset in hospital Mm. um it was a blessing not a curse and um i understand things better now um i understand things like we need to build a trauma-informed society we need to build trauma-informed churches we need trauma-informed um Everybody, really, you know, down to um, the barista in 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 the the coffee bar, you know. Um, I believe in in people like that getting training because you never know who's going to walk into your shop. You never know who's going to walk into um, your place of work. Yeah. Um, you never know who you're going to work with and what traumas other people bring. You know. Um, you can't judge a, a a person by how they seem. You know, it's, it, I know it's cliche to say you can't judge a book by its cover, and I know you can't. But there is, you know, I can look in a man's eyes and tell you if they've been into prison or if 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 they've lived a trauma because I've done that. And I live that every day. Yeah. And there are people out there that will never understand it. There are people out there that want to understand it. And there are people out there that could, really couldn't give two craps about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's always some keyboard warrior on Facebook. You know, earlier it was someone having a go at um, Ben Affleck because, you know, he he's blaming his uh, relationship with his wife for his drinking and you know people saying you know addiction isn't isn't a real disease it, you know he's just selfish and narcissistic and um there's so many people out there like that that don't understand that we just we've got so many demons that we've battled through our lives um you know we've fought so many battles it changes us like physically uh emotionally it changes the way our eyes look it changes the way that we gaze it changes the way we stand and people can never understand that there are people out there that will never understand that and there are always people out there that will use the toxicity of of, of facebook and um, twitter and stuff like that to just slate people but I've, I've walked more than a mile in 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 the shoes of an addict and you know um it, it did it killed me yeah yeah, yeah. and um yeah. it's like 
I've still got family that don't won't talk to me. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, me too. You know. And you know, I'm I'm okay, I'm okay with that. Today, I'm okay with that. Yeah. At one point, I was. I, I don't at one point, I was very resentful of that, but today I'm okay. Yeah, I, I, I think that's 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 a normal part of growth. Um, I had resentments, resentments, resentments. I couldn't stand that people didn't like me. You know, the fact that I tried to rip somebody's throat out once, <laughs> you know, but he didn't like me, and I'm like, well, why don't you like me? You know. <sighs> but I had to learn it's mind over matter. If I don't mind, they don't matter. So I don't let them take up in my mind. All I'm bothered about is what I think of me. My kids think I'm a dick half the time. <laughs> I think that's always you know? the case, right? Um, yeah, you, you know. Um, there are people that don't like me. But I like me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, so, sure that, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that don't like me too. And you know what? Yet again, used to bother me. I'm okay with it. That's their, but you know, it's none of my business what other people think about me. Yeah, it is. It is none of our business. And you, you, you know, there are people out there that you know. I've had it since. You know, I've had a limited amount of success in in the past sort of seven and a half years. And there are people that hate that. People in my life that hate that, that are, you know, family that hate that. The fact that, you know, I'm not remorseful of what I did. But the thing was that I was res- remorseful of the things that I did. And that remorse then led me to using and drinking. And it led me to all sorts of rock bottoms. And that's why I was the way that I was. So to get rid of resentment, to get rid of guilt, to get rid of shame... You know, and not to regret your past or wish to shut the door on it, but use it as a a tool to help other people find their way back on that, onto that road of recovery, whether it's for the first time or a hundredth time. It don't matter. It takes a tremendous amount of strength to even admit that you're an addict, to even admit that there's a problem. Um... And it's 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 my job. It's our job to teach that, to teach a different way of thinking. You know, um, to stop people thinking toxically about addicts, mm. about the homeless, to stop people from looking at someone and thinking, you know, people wouldn't give me money when I lived on the street because they thought I was going to sell it on drugs. Well, so what? That's what kept me kept me alive, right? You That's know, what kept right. me moving. Yeah, I hear that argument a lot. You know, the the not giving money to the homeless because of well, they're just going to spend it on drugs and alcohol. Well, first of all, that's probably what you were going to spend it on, right? So, give mm-hmm. the guy five bucks. And second of all, you don't know whether the, it whether that drink is the drink that could have got him through the night. That he will, you know, will wake up in the morning and have that epiphany and be like, I can't fucking do this anymore. You know, so if I can help somebody. You know, just exist until they until they can wake up, man. Until they go, I, I just I can't do this anymore. I, I just I, this is impossible. There's no way I can sustain this way of life. Uh, you know, if my five dollars or my ten dollars or whatever helps get him to get that person to that point, then you know it, it's worth the five or ten bucks to me. Like I, I just don't care. You know, I would I would rather them go spend it on drugs and alcohol <laughs> than them not have it in the first place if it means that exactly if due to that one you know if they can just because they're, they're going to get to that point or they're going to die and mm. either way they're going to free themselves of their suffering so yeah yeah you know it just seems like that'll wind me up but you, you know you know w- <laughs> people aren't going to change it the way that they think unless they're educated um, and I was a man that was uneducated at one one time, and you know somebody said to me, "If if you can teach, teach, and if you can't teach, I can teach," because there are people out there that need an education. They need to know that their the way that they're thinking is, you know, toxic to so many people. 
I've been called junkie, smackhead, crackhead, all these things, you know. I've been called nothing worse than I've called myself, to be honest. Right. But, you know, we, we need to look at that toxic terminology. We need to look at, you know, take it back, really. Um, you know, and, and just own it and own who we are. And I think think this is the nat- next natural step of us doing that, you know, talking to other people and, and, and sharing stories and, you know, um, testimony and, and because your darkness might be somebody else's light. Absolutely. You I think that's why that. we're bo- both doing this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I love yeah. the, way, the way you just said that. T- take it back. Like, let's take that back. Like, then that's kind of what I've done with the name of this podcast. You know, I call it Dharma Junkie. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I, that's my word. Like, I, that's my, I, I will self identify as that. You don't get to call me that, <laughs> but I can call myself that. <laughs> exactly. E- exactly. You know, I'll call myself a crackhead and, and all that. You know, um, like I say, no one can call me something that I haven't called myself in in in, in oh, yeah. time. <laughs> For sure, that no. <laughs> there's the no. literally quite literally nothing anybody can call me that's even offensive to me anymore. Like I've heard, I've heard it all so many times. I've heard it, you know, from one one end of the spectrum to the other. I've I've been called every name in the book, man. <laughs> like there's not anything you could say to me that's gonna really get under my skin as far as names are concerned these days. Exactly, you know, it's it's like. I've seen the way that it's it's the looks sometimes that that that, that, that would get me. You know, I've, I've um just I've got so mad like like I've you see somebody selling a, 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 a I don't know if you have big issue over there, but we have this magazine that they sold by homeless people that it's called the Big Issue, um, and you you, you buy so many copies. Um, at a certain price and then you sell them for more and then you get to keep some of the profit and um, you know they, they wear a, a red vest that says big issue on it mm. and you know you stand there and you say big issue big issue and you know you got some some of them that have got you know a bit of sales pizzazz and they're like you know but you see it you see it in people's eyes you see the fear and then you see the hand go in the pocket to stop the change from jingling. You know, um, you get the head drops. Putting them into the peripheral, out of the peripheral. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's why I, I, I talk about getting back into the main line of sight. You know, I cannot be anonymous anymore. I'm anonymous. I'm not anonymous, so somebody else can be. Right. Because um, I've been anonymous. Yeah. And for me, it 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 put me in a place where I didn't want to be. But not being anonymous and stepping out because of the wisdom that's been shared and the wisdom that has been given freely, then. You know, it's it, it, it's my job to give a voice to those that don't have a voice. It's my pleasure. It's my my passion, yeah. um, and it's my um, it's my job because I I know there are people out there that can't speak for themselves, and you doing this and talking to people is, is giving other people a you know a. Uh, giving them a uh, a voice, a platform, a soapbox. Um, yeah, and if one person just listens to the podcasts, I'm happy. Me, yeah, yeah I'm sure. not one for numbers. Yeah. I've got thirty follow- uh, I've got thirty subscribers on um, on YouTube. But you got more, got more than me. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't care about that shit though, man. Uh, no. I've had, it man, no. as long as somebody's getting, you know, and I've had some people like send me emails and tell me that they, they get, you know, that they got a lot out of this. And you know, they're like, I yes. can't afford therapy and this has really helped me a lot. And it's like, well, good. That's, that was kind of the goal. So like, if, if I got that, that's all I care about. So. That's, 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 that's with me. I, I cried the other day 
because I got an email from somebody. I I, I sat with a guy by the name of Eugene Eugene Scardifield, and his brother was murdered. So we sat talking like we are um, through Zoom, uh, but live on Facebook. I do my um, I do mine live. It's called Live and Undrugged. I get up to one point seven people, uh, one point seven k people on 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 Facebook that can watch. So that's where I get most of my viewers. But we just sat there and we started talking about um, the loss and the guilt and shame that we feel as survivors and, and, and you know losing members of the family. And we sat and we talked and we cried together. Two grown men, two men in their forties, sat over Zoom, mm. crying. Together, yeah, it's beautiful. and I get an email saying, "Thank you. I've been in therapy for months. For I've been through something similar. I didn't know how to deal with it. I came onto YouTube to look. This was the first video I came across, and this has helped me to begin to heal. That is why I get up every morning. That is why I keep doing these. That is why you'll find me hustling on Facebook, on Twitter, on um." on whatever to get these interviews for me to come on and speak or forget to people like you to come onto my platform and speak because it's so cathartic. It is so healing. Being able to speak of your trauma, being able to speak of your pain, being able to get emotional with an, uh, another person um, is just so freeing um, and so healing that it's just... I'm addicted, I, you know, I, 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 I love it. I, I... Yeah, I feel that, man, for sure. Yeah, and I really yeah. appreciate that you, you are doing essentially the same thing that I'm doing, and that's, you know, it's giving those people a voice, and it's, you know, I, I try to, I try to, you know, show people, uh, you know, as many different modalities of dealing with trauma and processing trauma as I can, and that's kind of what this this podcast has ended up being for, for, you know, one way or the other. That's just how it ended up. But, uh, like I said, you know, it, it's exactly, man. If I can get the, you know, those, and I don't get a lot of them, but when I do get them, those messages that were like, Hey, this, you know, this is really helping me. It's like, yes, that's what makes it all worth it. That's why I continue to do this thing. That's why I put the time into it. Cause yes, yeah, you know, you, you run a podcast. This is like, it's, it gets to be a lot of you like when you're like, Cal, start a podcast. And then you're like, Oh shit. I, I realize <laughs> I'm, I've got another full time job now. What the hell did I just do to myself? And I don't even get paid yeah. for this one. <laughs> exactly. You know, I booked up till Christmas and then I'm already now booking into February. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. getting people involved and, and getting on theirs. So, you know, I'm at the end of February, start of March, um, two or three nights a week, yeah. as well as serving in the yeah. community. Um, as as you know, as well as doing things at home and and doing my own projects like my books and stuff, it is a full time job. It's not cheap, you nope. know. <laughs> the not. reason I'm sat here in my coat is because I'm sat in my garden shed. Oh This yeah. is my garden shed. This oh, is my hey. office. Right. This is my. You you like this? That's my refrigerator. <laughs> nice. I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> That's my uh, shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you are you're as dedicated to this as I am, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I I love it, mate. I love it. I because I I love people. Yeah. You know, um, I love people when they don't even love themselves, and I think that's the point, right? And 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 that it, it isn't just the point. That is that is the reason, and I think that is the reason that we are sort of. You know, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on, on God and spirituality and stuff, but, you know, I, I believe that it's, it's it's part of my mission to love others that don't love themselves because, right. you, you know, I that, didn't love myself. That brings me to a, an interesting question. What what does your spirituality look like these days? Um. So, you know, it looks like... Um, going to church on a Sunday. Um, not just going to church, but serving in that church. Uh, I, uh, I'm uh, a member of the uh, the front of house team, so you know we we uh, 
you know, we do the sound, we do the video, right. um, we do the live stream. We just, as a church, we've been live streaming um, for the past year or so uh, over COVID, um, and we have this thing called uh, the, the, the the School of Supernatural Life, uh, which is. Um, I don't know if you know uh, uh, of the Bethel Church in uh, Redding, California. I've heard like of they, the they, Bethel. Similar. And it's about the next step of just our spiritual life and learning to trust our spiritual gifts and, 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 and to listen to God and, and, and to be, you know, what he, what he wants to be, to, um, you know, slightly to bring things like prophecy to each other. Um, and, and, and to the church, it also means um, serving on Alpha. Um, we have this thing called Alpha Course, and uh, it's where people that want to know about Christianity can come and ask all these questions. And no question is stupid. We come and we have a meal together, we have a chat, um, and we have a laugh. Um, and it means working with the local food bank. It means doing what I can within the local community. Um, and it means having to lead by example. And there have been times when I've, 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 I've faulted in that and I've wanted to smash somebody's face in because they've been in my face. <laughs> you, you know, and neighbors. Um, <laughs> you know, but um, it's about. You know, there was when I first came to this community. It's a small town. It's a small town. We have a huge, great abbey for a small town, um, but it is a small town. There's people. Everybody knows everybody, and you know there were rumours about me, and you know people that didn't like me because I was honest about my past, and you know I was honest about my addiction and honest about my feelings. Because people get scared of that, normal people. Um, so it's about that sort of education. Um, doing this um, is a big part of my spiritual journey. Um, just, uh, you know, I, I do some of these and we talk about God and, you know, I, I speak to Christians and it's nice to be able to do that. But I also speak to people like you. Um, I speak to atheists. I've spoken to Buddhists. Uh, every sort of religion that you can think of. Um, I've sat down and spoken with them because I, I am really genuinely interested in uh, good spiritual health. Because to have good mental health um, and good physical health, we need good spiritual health. Mm -hmm. um, and if that, you know, a God of my understanding... And if that for me is a god of my understanding, that's a god of someone else's understanding. They might call, you know, they might, they might call him Allah, uh, Jehovah. Um, you know, I call him Yahweh. But um, you know, it's about, like I said, teaching, being understanding, loving, um, even the people that I don't like, um, serving the community, serving my family. Um, and just being the best version of me that I can be um, for my kids and for my family you know um, being a healthy parent it's not you know it's not always easy I've got teenagers oh yeah you know yeah. I've got a boy that's going to be 16 in May oh god I've got a girl that's going to be 15 in May oh even I've got a girl that's just turned 13 <laughs> I've got a Ten-year-old girl. Wow. I've got a eight-year-old boy that's coming up to eight who's got ADHD. Uh, you know, all of them have got some form of emotional problems with school and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. So I, I try to be understanding. Mm. I, I try to be the best parent I can. I, you know, I do shout a bit. <laughs> to be honest, but. Um, that's that's a healthy part of being a parent, you know. Um, it's just those things that those things that people don't see. Mm. Um, 
you know, I, I, I do this and I talk, I, I talk freely, openly and frankly about my pain and my trauma. Mm. Um, and about homelessness and stuff like that. But I don't, you know, and I could create content. Um, I write poetry. I'm known as a poet. Uh, I've written a poetry book and, um, it was my first book, A oh, Personal cool. Apocalypse. Nice. And, is, that um, is it available anywhere? Um, the audio book is, this is, this is out of print and I'm looking at getting the money together to, um, bring out another another print of it uh, but the audio book is out there you can get in contact with me um and i will gladly send the um uh the audio file and my spoken word album um for five of your pounds um and the money that i get goes to my second life project which is getting using creativity to help addicts uh, and people uh, that have just got out of prison um, and helping them find a new way of life through creativity whether that be through poetry and creating their own books whether that be through music and creating their own albums um, you know uh, I believe in the power uh, and the healing of creativity it's what it's what it's one of the reasons I'm here as well you know right. yeah and, I, um, I can get on board with that I think that like just from my observation, I, I feel like if you don't have some something, whether it be a creative outlet, um, just just something that's that you hold dear, something that that gives your life meaning, something that's personal to you, that if you have any form of trauma, like substance abuse is going to kind of win by default just for lack of any other options. So like that's why like especially like doing this podcast is really important for me. It's a way to keep myself accountable to myself, you know? Yeah. And like, and I, and I love doing it. You know, I absolutely love doing it. I love talking to people such as yourself and hearing, you know, hearing all these stories and, you know, hearing how you, you came out the other side. You know, the, the, this is the, this is pure Joseph Campbell. This is the hero's journey, you know? And, uh, who doesn't love that's that line of story, you know? So, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I suppose the issue I have with like people say, you know, I've, I've had people call me inspirational, which, which is nice. And I've had people call me a hero and I'm like, well, am I no? You know, surely a hero is, is, is somebody that goes out there and does something extraordinary and thing. But you, you know, I, I wouldn't even dream about calling myself a hero, but what I do do is take ownership of, the life that I had, it might have took me a long, long time <laughs> to integrate myself back into society mm. um, in such a way uh, as, as, as I, I, I have. But, um, you know, I, I, I own that and I own that my part in it and the, it does take courage to... Um, to say that you're power, you know, to be powerless, to admit that you are powerless, by admitting you're becoming powerful, um, and we have to take ownership of that. J just by admitting that you're uh, an alcoholic, that you're an addict, that you you know, mm -hmm. that you're addicted to one thing or another, that is taking the power away from that and giving it to you. Um, I own that, but. Um, you know, you are right. It's, it's, it's kind of an odyssey. Um, and, and a journey. Is it a hero's journey? I, 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 I don't know, but it's certainly one with many battles. Um, some won and some surrendered. It takes a great amount of courage to surrender. Absolutely. You know, um, it's, it's not giving in. I thought that was giving in. I thought surrender was giving in. You know, uh, you, you, you've heard all the slogans, you know, surrender to win. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was like, what the fuck surrender to me, win me, you know? <laughs> How do you surrender to win? Oh, yeah, and, yeah. You, yeah, you it's know. A, it's it, only by giving up control that you can gain control. Yeah. 
Exactly. <laughs> you gotta let go of them. You just gotta be all right. It's just gonna work out. Like the things are gonna work out the way they are. I'm just gonna do the best job I can, and the outcome's gonna be the outcome. Mm. And just let it go, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a nice way of saying fuck it. Yeah. Basically. Basically, it's all you can yeah. do. I mean, like yeah, otherwise, you're just gonna torture yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and um, I don't want to be tortured that, anymore. We all know how that ends up. So where where can people find you at, man? Um, so you can find me uh, on facebook.com forward slash JW Greg, which is the Accidental Journalist uh, Facebook page. You can find me at um, 2.geeks1b at Twitter, which is the Accidental Journalist on Twitter. You can find me um, at jwgreg.wordpress.com, which is my website. And that's a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, that's got everything that I've ever done. Um, it's got all the live and hundred videos. Uh, once I get a, a copy of this as well, that will get links to the blog. Um, so people can access it and watch, uh, watch it and listen to it as well. Right. Um, it's, it's got my work. It's got my, uh, award selected films. I'm, I'm an award selected filmmaker. Um, you know, uh, yeah, um, if you want to purchase the uh, audio book, just drop me a line at JW Greg at Facebook, um, and uh, I'll gladly send it, and the money will be great re- re- received. Um, because you know I'm really pushing in in 2022 to get this up and running as a um, You know, I would like to be able to um, get people to, you know, write their, help them write their books, help them uh, make their albums, um, get a certain amount made so they can go out and sell them on the street right. and keep all the money. Yeah. You know, um, because that is a way of them then, you know, I never look look for a handout. It's always a hand up. Right. You know, I never offer a handout. It's always a hand up yeah. because I never wanted a handout. I never wanted people to, get, you know, give me this, that, and the other. I needed a hand up. I needed help. And sometimes that we have to, you know, go against everything that we believe and ask for help. Sometimes, sometimes. that's, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. And, um, you know, or uh, if if people are watching this, drop you a line. I'm sure you can drop it to me, and, and, and we can connect them that way. Absolutely. Um. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Hey, thank you again for taking the time to do this. Uh, I I really appreciate you coming on here and telling your story, and I think that everyone that listens to the show will certainly appreciate it as well. I, I really appreciate you having me on. We'll get you on mine. Sounds good. Thanks again to Jack for being on the show. If you'd like to get in touch with him, I'll have links to all of his work and his podcast in the liner notes of the episode for the show. Or you can just search wherever podcasts are found. Look for The Accidental Journalist. This has been Dharma Junkie. Namaste. Namaste.